However, in actual fact, the new world view of these two ideologies was itself a religion, which mercilessly persecuted dissenters. Human rights stood in the way of these totalitarian world views. Therefore, the totalitarian rulers abrogated human rights. Thus, one can say that these dictatorships constitute a regression into the pre-modern period, into the Dark Ages. That they were nevertheless able to unfold so much political potential is connected to the fact that they seem to have ready-made solutions for political problems which the people thought tempting, simple and pleasant. For example, the National Socialists wanted to turn Germany, humiliated by the Treaty of Versailles, into a superpower. And the Communists wanted to erase social injustice and war from the world history. Booths were mere propagandistic promises which neither could nor should have been kept. Their only aim was to bind the masses to the ideology which was more or less successful. In both systems, the totalitarian, the totalitarian claim the power that did not consider any institution as sacred took virtually the entire society into its possession. It was called cynical, dishones and murders. To face this challenge and overcome it was one of the major tasks in Europe in the last century. This was the task that the opposition in my country, the GDR, the East German state, had to deal with after the Second World War. One can phrase this challenge to the effect that it was about reinstating human rights. But this could only be achieved through a political master plan built on the further Western developments in democracy, with an advanced constitutional democracy, prosperous economy, with high living standards and high social standards. In 1989, the Socialist Unit Party of Germany, SED, this was the Communist Party in the GDR, had nothing to oppose this. Moreover, one has to say that the precondition for the end of the second German dictatorship ultimately were in the crisis of communism itself. A friend of mine commented, the communist committed harakiri. This might be true. True is also that the communist crisis were unavoidable and that it was vital for the opposition to use it. By the opposition in the GDR was it diverse as the path of emancipation itself. All that unified them was the rejection of a concrete shaping by the communist system and its inherent injustice and the will to party in political resistance. However, this was not enough for union of goal-oriented political action. Here, human rights proved themselves to be useful as the lowest common denominator so that on their basis political action could, could be organized. One opposition group, the Initiative for Peace and Human Rights, even named themselves after them. But the only reality, but the only really successful efforts in the opposition were those that clearly evolved themselves to the Western principles of constitutional and social democracy, the social market and a representative democracy with a democratic array, array of political parties. Of these, only a few existed. I had the pleasure and the honor of belonging to the SPD, Social Democratic in the GDR, Social Democratic Party in the GDR, 
I joined at its founding and became the first spokesman. The concept of the SPD consisted of a flawless Western democracy, socially, socially and ideologically oriented. The political aims we were representing found more and more adherence. The SPD attacked the Communist Party SED, which had governed up to that point also on the grounds of their ideology, and the SED could not longer defend itself. Of course, the social democratic concept including the appreciation of human rights, but the need for economic prosperity, the improvement of living standards, disempowerment of the SED, and the establishment of a constitutional democracy was clearly more than the guarantee of human rights alone. Human rights had a good ring to it. Unfortunately, human rights alone was not enough for the necessary mass mobilization. At least through their public activities, the oppositional groups were able to give a platform to the contemporary version against the SED dictatorship and thus prompt the mass protests that eventually led to the peaceful revolution in 1989. By then, the demand for integrated political concepts was high. Only with their help, the defeat of the SED could be sealed. In conclusion, in conclusion, it can be said that the human rights question served the formation of political forms of resistance, was a way to illustrate the hypocrisy of the totalitarian dictatorship to the public and was also a step on the way to more pronounced forms of political <coughs> opposition. It is difficult for me to just transfer this experience to Korea. This is a different part of the world. You have your own unique political culture and your own traditions. At the same time, in North Korea, the communists that I came to know well enough in the GDR are still ruling. But this experience taught me that communists alone would not have had the strength for taking over power if it had not linking itself to specific national traditions. What then is the reason for the power that the communists have developed here in Korea and why is it that the resistance in North Korea is as apparently low as it seems? After all, I know the people in North Korea are suffering harshly for minds arise repeatedly. The apparent mass history of the occasion of King Jong-il's death demonstrates that the ritual of personality cult which are so typically for totalitarian systems still work. But they must not be thought of as evidence of approval of the Communist Party. One of the most decisive catalysts for the distance of the East Germans from their state was the West German politics of menschliche Erleichterung. This is a German word. There is no equivalent in English term but it can be explained as it measures against personal hardship, such as family reunions, etc. It allowed visits by the relatives to a greater extent. By the mere presence of the Western system, the propaganda of the SED against the West was marginalized. My experience tells me that the communists will not cooperate. They will only soften their stains when they feel forced to. Moreover, they are very suspicious of every form of embrace by the West. This is why it makes no sense to promise the immunity from prosecution for the crimes. On the contrary, part of the democratic transition and part of becoming a constitutional state 
is accepting concrete responsibility for political wrongs. Responsibility can be apportioned, and one day will have to be apportioned. Neither the system nor a leader is completely at fault, and everybody bears an individual part of the blame.